right, so this is the article. It is, again, posted up on medium.com. Uh, I can definitely share a link to it, uh, but it shouldn't be too difficult to find. Uh, you just type in, you know, Google search and do Microsoft Access, the database software that won't die. And you'll get this one. It's by Matthew McDonald. They say it's an eight-minute read. I don't know how they calculate this reading time because it's almost always double for me. I, maybe I'm just a slow reader. Maybe everybody else out there is a really, really fast reader and eight minutes is exactly how much time it takes. But for me, no, I, I almost always have to double this in order to actually go through it. Now, it's obviously going to take me a lot longer because I'm going to give some commentary on this here. Uh, but uh, we'll go through. Let's take a look at it. So here's a Halloween story to scare the average corporate programmer. Imagine you put your valuable business data in a friendly database program backed by corporate megalith Microsoft. Everything seems perfect at first, but you can't shake the uncanny feeling of impending doom. Then the signs begin. The forms that work so well with three people use them uh, for when the, when three people use them get mysteriously uh, mysterious glitches. Boy, I cannot talk all of a sudden this morning. The forms that work so well when three people use them get mysterious glitches when the whole company joins in. Your boss asks you to make a web interface so a remote office can use the database and you find nothing. There's just a gaping, soulless void where web support should be. You go looking for the other conventional database ingredients you expect. A security model? <laughs> no, every user can access everything. Proper data integrity? No, nah, because there's just there's no log file recording database operations. Open standards? Don't even ask. Your blood begins to run cold. Most chilling of all, it isn't even free. All right, so I just kind of wanted to talk real quickly about all of this. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that, that Access gets knocked for because of this. The security model, there really isn't one. Uh, I, I've put together on my channel, obviously, some security-related things to help you kind of lock down the data, you know, split the database back in from the front end, and then you can lock it down with a password. Um, that doesn't mean that people can't still get access to it. Uh, it definitely helps a lot, though. It's much better to put your data on a SQL server and then use access as the front end to kind of talk to that database. And you can use the security settings for SQL in order to really lock down the data. Again, this is Coffee with Steve, so usually I've got a cup of coffee in my hand, uh, and I recommend that you guys all have a cop, cup of coffee in your hand when you're watching because that just kind of enhances the experience. Uh, so, yeah, the uh, proper d data integrity, that's another one that kind of happens. Um, you know, we've had to, you have to do fixes to your database pretty regularly, right? You've got the, um, oh, I forget what the name of that dang thing is, but, you know, you have to basically recompile the thing and it finds security issues. And you have to go in and and you know, fix the data that's in there. So if you're storing your data actually in an access database, uh, it really shouldn't, you shouldn't let it grow for too long. Once you have more than a handful of users that are accessing the, the data, it absolutely needs to be moved to a SQL server that's properly designed to handle multiple database connections, right? Multiple requests for resources. And that, again, has to do with this thing of, um, with logging, so he mentioned it, no, because there's no log file recording database operations. So this is a standard procedure for SQL databases uh, in that you're, when you're making changes to the data, you're actually, it's storing that request in a log so that it can kind of unwind some of the changes that you made. So you make your requests, it makes the changes. And then it's kind of like having a, a, a record of all the transactions, right? It's a log of all the transactions that have occurred so that you can go backward and forward through those things. Yeah. Oh, compact and repair. Thank you, Rolando. Yeah. The compact and repair. That's what we have to do to fix data integrity issues. Uh, and that doesn't always work. Sometimes we actually have to go in and inspect the individual cells that have corrupt data and try to fix them. And nobody really likes that, right? Nobody really likes the idea that their data might be corrupted just as a standard operating procedure of the of the database. That's kind of, but uh, again, that typically only happens if you have 
large numbers of people that are trying to access the tables in an actual access database. If it's a SQL database, then, you know, an actual like Microsoft SQL or MySQL or PostgreSQL, something like that, then your transactions are pretty, pretty well locked down because they have this logging mechanism. So, okay, open standards. Yeah, there's no open standards at all. Okay, but that's not even the good stuff. Let's, let's dig in even a little bit more. This is the story of Microsoft Access, an easy to use bit of database software that nearly 30 years ago, 30, that is, that's nearly 30 years old, and started showing its age at least a decade ago. You probably assume that Access, actually I think it was longer than that, but that's okay. <laughs> you probably assume that Access died a long time ago, and you'd be wrong. In fact, Access continues to shuffle along zombie-like, its usage neither growing nor declining. Microsoft has made more than one attempt to terminate it, but the user community has successfully fought to keep Access alive, even as other legacy products like FrontPage and Visual Basic 6 were left cold and bur buried in the dirt. And that is thanks to people like you and I, right? <laughs> thanks to people like me who put videos out there on tutorials on how to do this stuff. Uh, you guys all learn how to do it, and then that's what you guys want to do, and Access kind of sticks around. Um, I wish that Microsoft actually just paid more attention to access because I think that instead of trying to kill off the people that are using it, right, trying to kill the, not kill the people, sorry, that's the wrong phrasing, that totally the wrong phrasing, instead of trying to kill off the product that people like, uh, they should find ways of making it easier to migrate. That's what I think they really should have done is make access more pliable to other products and that make it easy to transition to. And I don't think that they really did that because they just kind of wanted to, they purposely neglected it. Let me increase, I think this will solve that a little bit. No, oh boy, that was wrong. Uh, sorry, my green screen isn't really doing too well. I can see the outline on my screen is kind of gray. That's weird. Mm -hmm. I need to fix that somehow. Anyway, um, but yeah, so the, the, the mere fact that you and I are doing this video right now is continuing the longevity of the product, right? It, it's becoming, uh, it's still a popular product simply because we, this community continues to exist and grow. And I shouldn't even say grow, it's, it, he's pretty right. It's pretty stagnant. The, the numbers don't really show that Microsoft has gained in popularity or, or I should say access has gained in popularity or dropped in popularity. Uh, it's easy to dismiss Access as nothing more than another legacy software nightmare, but the story of Access has lessons for every software designer. It gives us insights into what makes a productive live thrive and then linger long past its expiration date. Um, live. I said live, right? Uh, it gives us insights into what makes a product live, thrive, and then linger long past its expiration date. Um, okay, so how popular is Access really? Let's get one thing clear immediately. Access is not dead, nor is it about to be dead. This may seem like a violation of all that is sound and decent in the world of database software, but it is the grim truth. I wouldn't say it's necessarily grim, it's just, it's a useful tool, right? Uh, data research companies consistently find a small but loyal number of companies using Access. HG Insights counts 140,000 companies currently using Access, which is half the number that use the much more professional SQL Server. InfoClutch records a similar tally, and DB Engines, which ranks database software based on how often it appears in searches, social media, and sites like Stack Overflow. Uh, Deems access the world's ninth most popular database. Ninth most popular. So Oracle, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, IMDB2, Elasticsearch, Redis, and then there's access. <laughs> um, squeeze it into the top 10. Uh, these statistics almost certainly overstate the popularity of access. Many businesses use more than one type of database software and the applications they run with access almost certainly have smaller scope, deal with less data, and unless the CEO has a death wish, 
aren't governing a mission critical part of daily operations. Um, it depends on how big the oper the how big the company is. Uh, we were doing Microsoft Access for a very very large company, and again, the main thing was. The back end was SQL, the front end was Access. That was kind of the key to making it all work, but that doesn't mean we weren't doing mission critical stuff that was just simply straight Access applications. It was that if the user base of that application was very, very small, like it was just, you know, the the C-level uh, people, you know, needed access to the data or a couple of managers in specific departments to handle and access specific things. Um, then we would do an access database that didn't necessarily talk to a SQL server. But by and large, if you have mission critical stuff, yes, your database, your actual tables need to be in a SQL server, like MySQL, PostgreSQL, Oracle. Eh, I'm not a big Oracle fan, but yeah, I mean, something, something more robust and specifically designed for data storage uh, and persistence. But that doesn't mean access the front end, right? Like I think the thing that we really like about Access is the ability to to build things on the front end very quickly and easily, right? The reporting process, you know, the re creating a report, creating a form, that stuff is so much simpler in Microsoft Access that it's kind of like, why not? And then, you know, the use of macros that you can do. Um, prefer I prefer doing VBA over macros. You know, VBA has a lot more flexibility in what you can do, but it doesn't mean that you actually learn a programming language in order to do it. Uh, and that's why I think it's a good transition. If you are interested in becoming a programmer, you can start out with Access to understand kind of all the different levels of how software gets developed. This has been kind of my, my longstanding reason why I don't knock on Access all that much not only can you use it, but it's also a good starting point for people who are quote unquote power users that are interested in possibly becoming more proficient software developers. It's a, it's a, it's a gateway. It's a stepping stone on your way if that's something you want to do because you have to learn how to do reporting. You have to learn how to do form building and how to do, you know, what data binding is. You, you learn how to integrate, how to write SQL queries. You learn how to make forms. You have to uh, do reports, right? Like all of this stuff and understanding how different databases work and how you can integrate them with your system. And then you get the VBA code that you learn a programming language. It's not the best programming language, but it's a programming language that you understand the basics of, of how software development works. Like there's no reason why that can't be a good starting point for somebody. Um, I do think that there are better places to go, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work. And depending upon the route that you come into Access, it or or the the route that you see your your career going, Access can very well be a good stepping stone to building your career into software development. Okay, um, it's also true that companies use technology they don't realize they're using. Uh, yeah, so okay. It's also true that companies use technologies they don't realize they're using. For example, every business with a WordPress website is also relying on MySQL, even if someone else is hosting it for them. So this is just him basically talking about why people are still finding access databases on their network. And and trust me, this is I've I've dealt with Microsoft Access, you know, Access 97 databases that needed to be converted that existed in a Fortune 500 company. So yeah, it, they're they're around. They exist. They're a thing, uh, and and there is some um, legacy to it. Obviously, Access has a lot of legacy, and that's probably the majority of why I think it still has some appeal is because there is a legacy for it, and that knowledge doesn't necessarily get it thrown away. And then you also have the power user who wants just easy access to things, easy easeability, right? easy ease of use, in order to create those things um, without having to learn an entire programming language. Which, by the way, this guy gets into. Um, I have my own experience with the hidden popularity of access. In two thousand nine, I wrote a book about access on a whim. My reasons for writing the book were simple: I'd be using access for years. I'd, I'd been using Access for years for quick, ad hoc data solutions. 
right? That's what we all pretty much use it for. Things like keeping track of a collection of books or managing invoices and payments from my counseling work or consulting work. Uh, all of these scenarios need more structure and data editing control than Excel provides, but they can easily live with the restrictions of the access environment. A few tables, some relationships enforced with constraints, a small set of queries, a report or two, in an afternoon the job was done. And that's exactly it. That's, that's the niche. It's this, I don't need to do something really large and complex, but I need to do something. I, I need something to manage this that makes more sense than it's an Excel spreadsheet. Because Excel can get kind of cumbersome and, and difficult to deal with and unwieldy. All right. Uh, moving on. That said, I've never advised anyone to put an access database behind their e-commerce storefront. If you did that, it's on you. Yeah, that's that's really not not what you should do. <laughs> um, I wrote my book to capture the tricks and pitfalls I'd learned, sure that it would disappear quickly into obscurity. To my surprise, it became one of my most popular Sales still trickle in at a rate of roughly a copy sold every day or two. Clearly, there are people still interested in access, even if it's only because they're trying to untangle the mess left for them by previous generations of hobbyist programmer. Uh, yeah, and I I have a similar backstory, right? My Programming Made Easy channel was basically created strictly off of the Access 2013 video series that I did, six years ago, right? It's been six years and I still have tens of thousands of views a day, right? Like, well, not, not a day. Now it's, now it's like every two days. Now I get about 10,000 views every two days, but it's, uh, it's amazing. Like every week I've got these so many views, so many hits on old stuff from 2013. I can't, my busy schedule doesn't even really allow me to write the ones for 2016 in a timely manner, let alone that there's been a 2019 release of Access. And I can't, I can't keep up with it, and I don't have time to, to, to continuously work on these things. But yet, the popularity of it still grows. In fact, I was thinking, you know, when I was starting to do the 2016 series, I had to make a decision about whether or not I even wanted to do Access again. Because, number one, it's not the software I use anymore. I don't do Microsoft Access development anymore. Uh, and secondly, you know, the I wanted to start to take the, the channel in a different direction and do other software technologies. But I, the popularity of those videos just never really took off, right? The JavaScript series, the front end series, well, I haven't done JavaScript yet, but the front end series doesn't have near the, the viewership of my 2016 Access series. So... Which which set of videos am I supposed to make? I'm supposed to make the ones that everybody wants to go to and watch. And I'm I'm becoming the access guy, even though I don't even do access anymore. Like I, I, I can help every once in a while, but it's not my my area of expertise really much anymore. Uh so it's kind of put me in a little bit of a hole in terms of what I can do on the channel. Uh and and I it makes it difficult for me to put to produce that content since I don't have the direct interaction with access that I used to do. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, that's why a lot of these videos take a long time to, to make is because I just don't do it anymore. It's, it's a technology I don't, I don't work with, uh, and my career has gone off in a different direction, but that's what everybody watches the channel for. So I got to keep making them. Um, there's another reason why I kind of wanted to make this channel was so that I could do some of this content instead that, you know, I was trying to gleam away from there. Anyway, let's let's move on. You guys don't want to hear me ramble on about that. Uh, how to attempt to kill a program and fail. I like this meme. This is a great meme. I might copy this and, and send this out. This is when you come at the king, you best not miss. <laughs> that is a terrific meme for access. <laughs> uh, okay. Everyone who's lived in tech has seen a favorite piece of software meet an untimely end. There's an entire graveyard of, of abandoned Google projects. Oh boy, there is. Uh, Microsoft is also no notorious for killing its children, sometimes even several at a time, like when it retired Expression Studio 
an entire family of web design and media encoding tools that were meant to compete with Adobe. But for some reason, when, when Microsoft Access came after Access, they blinked. When Microsoft came after Access, they blinked. The first mistake was deciding not to execute Access in one step, like they had with Silverlight, PhotoDraw, Minecraft, and so many others. Minecraft? Is Minecraft still around? I don't know. Instead, Microsoft tried to gently encourage Access into irrelevance. First, they tried to sideline Access by pointedly ignoring it. A few months before the Office 2013 release, Microsoft still had no official answer as to whether they'd even be in Access 2013. They, then they began hacking away at its features, removing old and sometimes still popular standbys. Gone was the ability to import old formats like DBase. Gone was the ability to create pivot tables. Gone was the ability to create an Access front end for a SQL Server database, and boy, that really irked me when they did that. I had just discovered that capability and they chopped it off. I was so mad at that. And with it, the upsizing wizard for migrating access database to SQL Server. It was like a nightmare from, hostel fr from the Hostel franchise. Every release, Microsoft hacked off another piece of access an anatomy and still the program remained. Most dramatic of all were the attempts to provide an upgrade path out of the Access world. In quick succession, Microsoft created and then abandoned no less than three different frameworks for putting Access database on the web. Um, two, Access web databases introduced in Access 2010 and Access, Access web apps introduced in, in Access 2013 were built on SharePoint and SQL Server. Neither succeeded. And Access 2019 became the first version of software in over a decade to have no web features at all. Here was something we hadn't seen with other bits of Misfit software. We were watching Microsoft trying to provide an upgrade path out, out of Access, failing, and then giving up entirely. Like Frankenstein's monster, the creator had abandoned the creation, but still wasn't able to kill it. Now, I want to talk real quick about this because... I don't necessarily consider this an, an upgrade path out of access. That was not an upgrade path out of access. Okay, moving your data base essentially over to, to SharePoint was not actually a way out. Um, again, I'm going to give the same thing. You guys have probably heard me say this before. If access just simply changed their backend VBA com stuff, over to a .NET, over to .NET. If they had just done that, made it a, a, something that you could actually build in a .NET framework, then we would have a transfer path. Then we could take a Microsoft Access application that your quote unquote power user built and hand it over to the development side who knows .NET and they could handle it. They could work with it. But instead we get these hacky transitional things to that are really just to support the functionality of access and kind of give give the ability to do some access things in the web and that just wasn't ever going to happen that wasn't ever going to work um this is why the path that i consistently try to tell people on is to tell people is if you're going to try to transition off of access to something else more more substantial You've got to move the data. You've got to split the data away from the front end to a, an actual database like SQL Server. And then you have to start building that other front end to integrate with that database so that you have both versions. You have both access and that web application. But that doesn't mean you need to have a web application that is working with the database, right? So they need to be built essentially kind of in parallel. And that's the only way you're going to transition out of access. There are some tools that allow you to, like, there's some people that specialize in migrating access over to forms. And I think there was even one, some software tool that was supposed to do the conversion for you, but it just never really gained in popularity. Microsoft really needs to come out with a proper pathway out of access. And I think .NET is the way that they should look at to do that. 
by simply changing the back end of Access to be a .NET platform. And if they did that, it would make all of this so much simpler, but I think they just don't want to spend any time or resources on it. It's just zombie-like, as he says. It's just continuing to go on, and we still have a community. There's still strong support, and, and the people that are using it are managers and C-suite level people. Um, those are the people that are talking to, you know, that, that Microsoft has to cater to because they're the ones paying the bills. So if you stop doing access, you're going to tick off a lot of people that are Microsoft supporters. So that's just why I think that we still have the longevity of access. Uh, lessons from access and its enduring life. It's no surprise that old things linger in the world of technology. We still have COBOL after all. But what's unusual with Access is that it endures despite the not-so-benign neglect of the company that created it. Again, don't forget to drink your coffee. What makes Access so enduring despite its limits? There are a combination of reasons, both cultural and practical, but three stand out. Number one, the power user gap. And this is, this is the, yeah, this is probably the biggest one is who the user is that's being targeted with access. There isn't really a comparable product out there. Well, there are, I shouldn't say that there aren't, but there, there are, but they also have kind of the same pitfalls. The access audience is a special crowd that's rarely targeted these days. Technical people who aren't serious coders. They may know their way around an office macro, but they don't have a formal programming background. Not so long ago, we called this kind of person a power user. Power users can be dangerous, a, a dangerous group to help. With a little knowledge, you can make a very powerful weapon for shooting yourself in the foot. And boy, is that ever a true statement. Um, I've seen this time and time again. Uh, but there is a serious untapped potential here. Give a technical person a way to solve their problems that doesn't involve writing pages of code, and they can make a difference. Automating small tasks, managing their own islands of data, and helping to keep their local environment organized and effective. And again, that's another reason why I say if they just figured out a way to, to switch from COM over to .NET for the back end, and what Microsoft Access is working, working with, you could make it so that the power user can continue to do their development in access and then hand it over once it gets too large to their actual to an actual programmer right that's the consistent problem is that these things linger access lingers because there's very few people that actually know how to manage it and modify it and scale it for an enterprise solution uh and be, you know, your typical software developer doesn't do access. They don't know access. They might know of access. They may, you know, as somebody else has said, think that it's a toy, right? It's a toy database. Uh, and they don't realize the upside and the potential, nor why the power user base is so strong with it. But if they had that pathway to .NET, then it would be easy for a power user to build an application to do what they need to, and then hand it over to an actual software developer once it grows too large. And then you don't run into that glass ceiling, right? It doesn't get too big for the business to continue to support without bringing in a specialist. Um, and in some ways, I guess, you know, I could probably, if I wanted to, I could build a career out of being nothing but an access consultant and just fix all of these things and, and, and continue to support all of these access databases for enterprise companies. Like that's, that's part of what I was doing and I could do it on my own as a, as a consultant, but that's not really want, where I want my career to go. But it is a, a niche that's needed. And I bet any, anybody watching this right now could probably fill that niche. If you spent a lot of time working with access databases, you could probably go into consulting for access. Anyway, uh, today there remains a hunger for codeless or code light tools. Motivated people want to do their jobs without paying expensive professionals for every semicolon. But so far, the only offerings we've, we've given them are VBA macro language from a generation ago and pricey tools like power apps that only work if your business signs up for a stack of Microsoft Cloud products. Exactly. 
there isn't a good pathway out of it. That's one of the big reasons why people are still doing it. He really hits the nail on the head here, doesn't he? And number two, true power is empowering someone else. If there's one secret to access to success, it's this. Access succeeded because it made people feel powerful. Here's another example of access at work. My partner tracks families, students, classes, and attendance for a small music school that's had multiple locations. There's no danger of multiple people editing the database at the same time. And there's no need to open the data up to other platforms. Would a full-blown SQL Server application uh, would a full-blown SQL Server application better? That's a weird. Uh, I think he probably needs to edit that. Yes, and I could even do it for free with SQL Server Express. But even though designing such an application is a straightforward task, it isn't a done in a day sort of affair. There's no easy way for the user of that application to enhance it with their own forms of reports like they can with access. That's right. It's just, it's a very powerful tool. It gives you kind of everything in a box. It's the Swiss army knife. Uh, it's a small Swiss army knife, but it's a Swiss army knife. And it does the, it does the job for small purposes, right? For small businesses. Never overestimate it just works. Consider for a moment what's involved setting up a professional database solution. To assemble the SQL Server Express example I just mentioned, you'd need at minimum to complete these steps. Install SQL Server Express. Make sure a number of configuration settings are correctly in place so that the database service starts up on command. Download SQL Server Management Studio so you don't need to create databases at the command line using SQL commands. Create the database and its tables. This part is almost as easy in access. Uh, or as easy as access. It is. Like creating tables in SQL Server is really just the same as, as access. Uh, choose a programming language, database library, and development environment. Maybe you'll pick something like Visual Studio Community, which will helpfully build bundle these pieces together. Make a connection to your database in your code. Depending on your approach, you might be writing your own code or using a code generation tool like Entity Framework. Now here's where the fun begins. In order to access the database, you need to grant the correct database permissions to the account running your code, which is often not, not your account. In many years of teaching programming, this has never failed to present a stumbling block for coding newbies. That's right. That is definitely a big hurdle, is understanding the security principles involved in trying to connect a piece of software to a SQL database. Um, yeah. <laughs> What's in the briefcase? A connection string that works on the first try. <laughs> uh, that's from Pulp Fiction. Um, famous For those of you who haven't watched the movie Pulp Fiction, it's a very famous Quentin Tarantino movie. Um, these guys, So these guys are trying to track down this, uh, this briefcase that nobody knows what's actually inside of it. Nobody, the, the audience never sees what's inside of it, but it has this gold shimmer. So it's something very valuable and important, but nobody nobody watching the movie actually knows what it is. Uh, anyway, so this sequence doesn't actually make anything. It's just what you need to prepare your environment, right? All of those steps are just preparation, not even building anything. That's just preparing to build. The sequence doesn't actually make anything. It's just what you need to prepare your environment, compare it to the startup costs of access. There is almost no way to fire up Access, create a database, and have it not work. It's difficult to put price on convenience, but the attraction of something that just works has turned many ordinary technologies into overnight sensations. So the answer of why Access is still alive, a somewhat embracing, embarrassing zombie standing in the corner of a party where it definitely wasn't invited, is simple. Access works for ordinary people. The fact that it encourages bad habits and the fact that scaling it up invites near certain catastrophe is beside the point. As long as no one wants to build a tool that gives ordinary people as much power with as little complexity, access will shamble along, unwelcome, and all but disowned by its creator. But still with a purpose to serve. The real question is, do we dare build a database for everyone toolkit to replace it? Um... So yeah, and, and I think, what a great article. This really is a great article. Um, <clears throat> in fact, I'm gonna give it the little hand clap thingy. There we go. 
Uh, really well thought out, really well done and articulated. All the points are just really good points. And, and maybe not always data backed, but I think absolutely true for anybody who's experienced access or, or worked with access. I think going back to his final conclusion statement here, let me just scroll down. Um, you know, as long as no one wants to build a tool that gives ordinary people as much power with little complexity, access will shamble along. Uh, and, and, you know, do we dare build a database for every one toolkit to replace it? There's actually several of them out there that are like this. And there was one, uh, you know, there was one that Microsoft put out called Light Switch that I was very, very interested in. I thought that was going to be a great direction. But unfortunately, sh because they, they, killed Silverlight, um, they also had to kill uh, Light Switch because uh, Light Switch was using Silverlight to do its website of things. Uh, there was still a database, or I should say a front, a .NET framework side of it that was doing forms, uh, WPF forms. But... Uh, and I, I wish that Microsoft had continued to, to work on light switch because that did seem like a very viable option for converting over people into doing real software development, but having a somewhat easier time of, of building it. And that's the thing is like the tools that if they just figured out a way to make the access tooling right that the the ide that simplifies the the pieces that you have to to that you have at your disposal to build the things um but then ba based it upon dot net on the back end or even if it's some other technology if it's java or if it's python or whatever other language right just give us an ide that simplifies our building process it doesn't have to give us access to everything. It doesn't have to give us access to the entire framework. Just give us those pieces that are necessary for this particular thing that we're trying to accomplish and narrow our focus. But build it so that the back end is something that could be expanded by somebody with more technical experience. Then that would allow the power users to focus on just the tasks of what they're trying to accomplish, but also permit a, a larger expansion of the product by actual software developers. That's what needs to occur. And I think Access, again, could very easily do this. Well, I shouldn't say easily. I don't know exactly. I mean, converting everything from column over to .NET is not an easy process. That, that I totally get. But if they did do that, then you would have the product that we're talking about. And it would finally allow for the transition. If Microsoft really actually wanted to kill off Access, they could finally successfully do it. They just don't want to put the money, time, or effort into actually doing that kind of thing. Uh, it's it's not an easy process to, to completely rework the back end from off of com into .NET. I know that that's not an easy process. But if you put some man hours into it, it would be so worthwhile for Microsoft. Uh, and this has been what I've been saying for years. Uh, anyway, this is, again, really great article. Um <clears throat> I'm going to have to, I definitely want to want to post this up. Let's see what some of the responses were. Uh, just FYI, Access is not a database. Access is a rapid application development tool. Access is what we use to create application objects such as forms, reports, and code modules. Jet and Ace are the underlying database engines that store Access objects. Access is also the SSMS for Jet and, with, and Ace. Without access as the GUI, you would need to do DAO or ADO to create and manage the database. For these two reasons, many people, including the author, conflate access with the desktop RDBMS, more properly called JET, with, and ACE, ACCDB files. Because of the confusion perpetuated by articles like this, people compare access to SQL Server, which of course is meaningless. Wow. Um, okay, Patricia. Uh, okay. I don't understand why you're being so harsh to the author. Confusion? It's not a confusing... Like, I don't think that he's saying that 
that access entirely is just a database software. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think that's kind of a, that seems to be taking this little tiny speck of what you've in what you've perceived of the article and making it a mole, you know, making it a mountain out of that little molehill. Uh, but because of the confusion perpetuated by articles like this, people compare access to SQL Server, which of course is meaningless. I, I disagree with that. It absolutely has meaning. Uh, just because it's it's and and I don't think Matthew at any point said something like they're the same thing. Um, I think he was just talking about how the data can be a SQL Server. Uh, I don't uh, anyway. Uh, this confusion also causes access to get tagged with all the limitations of Jet and Ace regarding the size of data store and the number of con concurrent users that can be reasonably supported. When in fact, access used as the front end to SQL Server, Oracle, DB2, uh, Cypace, Pervasive, to name just five of the RDBMs I've used as data source for my access applications is infinitely scalable. And that is absolutely true. I agree with this comment entirely. Um, I don't necessarily think that the tone being set on the outset was, was the right one, but I understand that this is, this I agree with. You can use access still as a front end and then just move the data over to some sort of more robust database system. But that still requires, to Matthew's point, that still requires a considerable amount of configuration and setup. We have the migration tool, which makes things a little bit easier. But at the same time, the robustness of doing that transition. So when you translate your database over to SQL Server, it's not a pop into place kind of thing. You have to understand the configuration settings and also quite often access databases get much slower when you do that, okay? Because you're using a translation service between access to the SQL server. There has to be a translation into a format that access understands. The only way you avoid that, so if, if I wrote a query, okay? If I wrote a, an access query, that talks to multiple tables in my access database. Then I move those tables over to SQL Server. My query will run slower, okay? My query will run slower. The only way I can solve that is to actually make the query VBA code. Move all of that logic of the query into an actual uh, SQL query that runs on the SQL Server and returns back to me a data set that I work with in VBA. It's the only way I can avoid this translation process that slows down, that slows down the use. So even this discussion that, that you know, and, and with all due respect to, and, and maybe the tone kind of put me off here on Patricia's comment, but the, the just moving over to another database, that doesn't, that actually makes it initially a bigger problem in that it's much slower. Uh, so, but you, you have to solve that by being a much more proficient software developer and using VBA to, to connect with ADO or DAO and, and talk to the database directly and have the database do all the querying and return back record sets so that you ignore the JET or ACE engine that does the translation for access, right? Because if you write a query in access, it's using the, the JET or ACE engine. Even if you are connecting to another SQL server, there's a translation process that happens that slows down your queries. Uh, so yeah, it's it's not as simple as just saying, oh, well, we could just move the back end over to the SQL server. That's what you want to do, but that doesn't eliminate all the problems. In fact, that creates a new one. It holds, creates a whole set of new ones, okay? Um, not to mention that when using an RDBMS other than JET or ACE, you get all of the security and features the database supports. Right, of course. Professionally developers access application front ends are never ever shared. Professionally developed access application front ends are never ever shared. I disagree. Uh, I have worked plenty of environments where we distribute a front end. Uh, in fact, we used to have, so there's a couple of different ways you can do it. One of the things that we used to do is just distribute a batch file that would uh, that would open up 
So, okay. So we'd open up a batch file that would just go to the network drive and copy the front end, the, the current existing front end and put it on their desktop and then execute it. So that that way they were always getting the latest, most updated version of the front end. Like that was one of the things that we did. So in order to access your application, click on this batch file that copies the, the file from off the network onto your computer and then executes it. That was one way. Another way we had was uh, where the the application would talk to another access application and that app access application would check the version number of your currently running front end. And if the currently running front end was older than what currently exists on the system, it would automatically update that old one. It would delete the 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 old version of the front end and copy it from off the network and put it on the front on the desktop for you. So yes, we absolutely distributed it. Uh, you can also do some cool stuff with like um, if you're doing uh, domain, if you're managing your domain using um, Microsoft technology, right? Like a uh, a domain controller, and you've got group policy turned on, and you're working with group policy, you can do some cool things with that too, and make that batch file happen essentially on startup of a computer uh, of a desktop. So there's there's definitely ways of distributing, okay? Like I, I think that's an incorrect statement that you never ever share. You absolutely share. You I do it all the time. Uh, each user has his own personal copy of the front end, just as he has his own personal copy of Word.exe. I again totally disagree. Um, the negatives of access the RAD tool are many, starting with the inability to lock the source in some way, which prevents access from being a, a viable tool for products sold to the public. Um, you can, that's what ACCDE is. You, you obscure the VBA source in an ACCDE. So again, I, I don't, I, I disagree. But while access is a screwdriver rather than a Swiss army knife, it is absolutely the best screwdriver you will ever use if you are creating a data-centric application in a one developer environment. Um, okay. It is so good that it actually that it is actually dangerous in the hands of semi-literate users who dabble at development and that also leads to much of its bad press. So one of its greatest strengths, easy to understand with the use of non-developers, is also one of its weaknesses. Again, I, I, I have to kind of disagree with that. I think that it's not necessarily a negative. Uh, and, and what Matthew was saying here is that, yes, it, it, it's dangerous. It's, you know, you can build a big enough weapon to shoot yourself in the foot with, right, and cause yourself a lot of harm. Uh, but I think that the point that, that she's trying to make here, I, I kind of disagree with because semi-literate users who dabble at, inv at development – and it leads to much of its bad press. I disagree with that. I think the bad press is the the fact that there is um, so much legacy. There is so much legacy to access, and it and it just consistently gets unsupported by Microsoft. We we we're constantly in this state of is it going to continue to exist or not? Like every single new release of Office. We ask, is access still going to be a thing? And now we're even wondering, as Microsoft continues to go more and more onto web, you know, cloud-based solutions uh, and going with Office 365, does what's going to happen to access? Because access isn't really, access is a desktop software. It's not a cloud software. So we still have this, con like, we might not even see Office as a desktop suite. That's, it's becoming a little bit more complicated to get that. Uh, that's the thing. It's like, do we know what the state of access is? That is the consistent problem. That's the number one knock on access, I think, is that Microsoft just treats it like it's, you know, it belongs in the closet, and then they pull it out every once in a while to, to dust off the cobwebs and, and pass it around again, and then they put it back in the closet. Its biggest weakness, though, is Microsoft itself. MS seems to have no clue what access is either. I almost got into a fight with the SQL Server manager in the New York City office back in 2006 because he insisted that access was dead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had just come from a meeting with the access team in Redmond where I got a preview of access 2007, and I assured him that access wasn't dead and that MS had spent more on the development of access for this version than they had since access 97. 
Totally agree. That that 2007 was a revolutionary year for Access. He wasn't buying it. He thought Jet was Access, and since Access, was, as of 2007, wasn't using Jet, then Access was dead. The fact that Access team had taken over Jet and made it into Ace, which they would control going forward, can't carry any weight. He had this opinion, and he was sticking to it. MS fails completely when it comes to marketing Access. Access isn't a competitor to SQL Server. It is a, compl- a complement. I I agree with that, but I maybe she's being colored by what Matthew was saying because of her opinion here. Uh, I disagree that it's being presented as a competitor. I don't think Matthew is talking about it as a competitor to SQL Server. So that might be coloring her initial first paragraph that she was talking about. No one in their right minds would choose Jet Ace over SQL Server if SQL Server was an option, but they could create great scalable RAD applications using Access with SQL Server as the backend. Access could be a great modeling tool for big projects as well as being used to create far more applications than it does now if MS could only see the light. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And in fact, maybe another route would be figure out some way that instead of using the Ace engine, we, we had kind of a built-in SQL Server. Like, and then integrate the security measures of SQL Server into the Access IDE, right? If we could do that, you would solve a bunch of this. Just make it by default, drop the ACE engine, if you will, and make it a SQL Server. That would probably solve a lot of this. Regarding the web webinization, I made this word, word up of Access. In my opinion, MS has never actually gotten it. When people say that they want access to run remotely, they are not asking for a web app. Um, I quite often get explicitly asked this, uh, but I get. What, I think I know what she's saying. Is sometimes it's, "Hey, I want to work on this from home. How can I work? How can I do an access database on my computer at home when the backend exists on the network?" And we have to implement some sort of VPN solution, which slows down the whole thing, right? Uh, Then the only answer to that is to do a web application. Or you could put the database on the cloud or something, you know, make your SQL server accessible via the cloud, and then have access talk to the SQL server that way. Uh, There are lots of web tools out there, and they create very different applications from Access, and so did Microsoft's attempts. None of MS's attempts could work with existing applications. Although you still used Access to build the apps, everything was different. The forms were different and separate and not interchangeable with developers, and developers were restricted to macros rather than VBA. Is a bridge too far? I agree with that. That's, that's a fair statement. What people actually mean is that they want their existing client server Access apps to be able to link to Access to data across the internet. I agree. Um, but again, sometimes that is web. Can we get a web front end? I get that question a lot. How can I make this a web app? How can I make my access application a web application? I get that question a lot. Of course, access can already do this if you care to try it. You just need the IP of a database that will accept remote connections to try it, right? Which a lot of places you don't want to do that because that means you're opening up the firewall to directly to your SQL server, which is typically a bad business practice. The problem it is to, sh- to uh, the problem is it is too slow. You can watch the pixels paint. What MS needs to do is to fix the plumbing so that access access is the an, an RDBMS on the server in East Oskosh Oskosh can retrieve and update data effectively the way a web page does. People want to be able to use the existing apps or build new ones using access they lo- know and love. They just want to be able to reach remote data. A regular access FE linked to SharePoint actually did this. The problem, of course, was SharePoint, which couldn't support tables larger than a few thousand rows and which wasn't actually a relational database. Completely agree with that. Uh, Azure was a lot more promising, although it would be better if any RDBMS could be used with the appropriate ODBC driver. So I agree with some of what she says. I disagree with kind of her initial statement here. Patrice, thank you for posting this 12 months ago. Wow, this is old. I didn't realize how old this article was. Why did it come up in my thing now? It's over a year old, apparently. Yeah, October 30. Oh, one year ago. Less than one, almost one year ago. Okay, anyway. Um, 
Yeah, I think there's some good reasons to, to uh, she points out, but I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with all of it. Shows how long low-code, no-code dev Sumer has been around before getting buzzwords into an investment hypothesis. The amount of people who are logical systems thinkers but not drawing to programming is non-trivial in non-trivially non-trivially large. Tools like this are a are beautiful, empowering, and still far outstrip Airtable retool from a functional standpoint. It's hard to imagine the new crop of tools outstripping access in under five years. It's a great goddamn product. Fifteen years of neglect, and there's still be use and there will still be use cases it handles better than the market newcomers huge props to the product and engineering teams that brought this to life great article yeah i agree totally agree with that um good sentiment there colin i'll just read a few more of these uh we're getting a little long in the tooth here on this video uh joe and kent have it right access has always been a useful way of quickly creating reports form letters input screens etc for its own or sql server tables that's what draws so many businesses to it. Without programming, you can knock up complex multi-level reports, mailings and queries far in excess of the kind of things Excel can do. And what's more, you can do it using your spreadsheet data too. Access has survived because it does, for the power user, what spreadsheets did for, for users generally. Makes main, uh, manipulating and reporting on complex data relationships easy for small values of easy. I'm still actively developing an access system that has been in use by one business for over 18 years. I've moved it from being a single, a shared single user application to a replicated multi-user client server, SQL server hosted application, but with the same very domain specific access front end. I've moved data from a comprehensive CRM system that was used, that was used standalone into the access app and added forms and reports to blend it seamlessly into their main workflows. Recently, I've built web apps in Python Bootstrap that provide for customer interaction with the backend data and allow online payments to be taken. All of this integrated with the firm's accounting systems, so manual posting of entries is avoided. The Access front end also controls customer use of the electronic devices provided to those customers by the firm. This incredible flexibility, connectedness, and user customizable behavior is exactly why Access doesn't die. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's good stuff, and I, I think I'm going to drop off there. Um, I don't think access is going to die anytime soon until there is a suitable replacement. That's, that's the short and long of it. Until there is a suitable replacement, access will not die. It's not going away. It's going to stick around. Okay. Um, there is the potential as always that Microsoft may one day just say, you know what? We're just going to kill it. We're done. If you haven't figured out how to move over to something else, then that's it. Uh, but my, I have serious doubts about that because of the fact that, as I mentioned before, the quote unquote power user is typically somebody in management or somebody higher up in, in the organization that's not a developer. And uh, they don't have time to think about things such as development. They have business processes to, to work on, right? And so Access becomes a great tool for doing that. And, and I've worked with people in major companies that found Access to be the exact right tool for the, for the scenario. Uh, if Microsoft killed it, what would you replace it with? You would have not just a screaming community that we of, of just the people that currently kind of support and build on access, uh, but also those managers and C-level, you know, people, you know, C-level, uh, you know, business, oh my God, what am I, what I'm trying to see, C-suite people, right? Like CEOs, CTOs, CIOs, that sort of thing. Um, their, their COOs, <laughs> they're, they're all, they like access. They really like access because heck you can have, um, just as I can build a complex web application to do customer facing business transactions, I can then create a Microsoft Access application that prints out the reports that the CEO likes to look at to tell him, you know, the monthly sales reports 
or the, the, you know, the VP of sales wants to know what each individual sales representative has been selling in every year. So, um, uh, Francisco says, I think Power BI is a better tool for reporting than Access. I would agree with you. Uh, I think it's a little bit more complex to set up and do, though, right? And then how do you con how do you work with the data? Um, it it's, I guess it's just BI, uh, Power BI, I don't really get too much into because, you know, it's, again, not really an area that I go, that I spend much time on anymore because um, I'm not really in the data data science sphere anymore. And I, I do kind of consider Microsoft Access to be slightly into the data sciences. It's not quite a data, it's like a really, it's like our data science tool light is what Access can do. Um, it can get you the data that you need quickly and be reported on easily. Um, and and uh, that's gonna continue to be the niche that it has. And as long as managers which managers love that, right? Being able to find reports, being able to have forms, being able to look at the table and, and do special queries to go query the, the table data without having the hassle of going through a web environment or having a software developer build a web environment and basically get some direct access to those type of tools and utilities. As long as that's the thing, the, the managers are gonna want to continue to have that kind of, of access uh, and, and have access as a tool to do that. There, if I, if I, as a business owner, let's say a CEO or a CTO or some sort of sweet C-suite level, um, person said, I want a report on X, Y, Z. And I talk to my developer and my developer says, well, it's going to take me about, uh, well, it's going to take me at least a week to get that done. And I have an access a application that I can get that done in a half a day. Which one am I going to want to have it built in? Uh, if Microsoft were to try to terminate Access, I think you would have a management uproar. We have so much legacy with Access and too much buy-in from upper level management for it to really go away. Uh, regardless of what the development community says, regardless of what we as developers of Access actually think or believe, it's those people that I think actually continue to keep it going. Uh, so, yep, yeah, that's where I'm going to probably go ahead and uh, stop this live streaming. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for watching. Um, I know Access is definitely one of the more popular topics, so I'm glad you guys could, could tag along on this one. Let me know what you think of the topic. And, um, you know, if you guys have an idea of something you'd like me to cover or talk about, uh, feel free to drop it in the comment section below this. Uh, please, I, I I can't really do, I get these requests all the time. I honestly do about, you know, I've got, can, can you explain to me how to do um, security integration with my access database for this form and that form and this form? Like, I can't help you with that. I can't, I don't know your database. I don't know your application. Uh, it, it would how am I supposed to tell you how to do something if I don't even understand the domain that you're working in? I I can't help you in comments, okay? YouTube is not the right place for that. You need an actual consultant. You need actual support. That's the only way that you're actually going to get that. Um, I can't help you, and, and it's not even my area of expertise. I am not a consultant in terms of, uh, you know, access database development. So I, I apologize if that's what you want to put in the comment section. I'm, I'm telling you right now, I cannot help you with that. Uh, my best suggestion is to go to a place like uh, Access Forums and and go ask your question there because you can actually find people that, that have the time and the ability and, and can consult with you on your Access application. I just simply cannot. Um, if you have a question though regarding, you know, the future of Access or, you know, uh, what are some of the features that I would like to see in Access or... Uh, what are some other programming languages you should explore or, uh, you know, what's going on, what's going on in the world of agile or, you know, or safe or extreme programming. Um, that's where I'm, I'm in right now. If you're looking about .NET, if you want to know something about .NET or Java or Oracle or pretty much anything else other than how do I do X, Y, Z with my application, 
Uh, I can help you with that. I can, I, we can talk about that. But um, if you do have one of those things, you know, if you do have a question that you'd like me to talk about, uh, please feel free to drop it in the comment section, and I would love to tackle it. Uh, if you have an article that you want to share with me or a video you want me to review, that's another really good thing. Uh, I, I like to review videos. I like to read articles like this one today and just kind of give my opinion, and I think it's pretty helpful. Okay, guys, thank you so much for tagging along with me. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to like, you know, hit that thumbs up button. Let me know that you liked it. Uh, you know, drop a comment in. Um, if you didn't like the video, that's fine. You know, people don't like my videos all the time. Just make sure the most frustrating thing is when people give me a thumbs down and don't give me a comment as to why. So if you give a thumbs down, please, please, please tell me why. What was it that you didn't like about the video? Uh, Francisco says, what about some videos about database optimization? Oh, okay, that's a good, that's a good topic. Um, yeah, uh, Francisco, can you drop that in the, like the actual comments when this video uh, drops? I'm, I'm going to, once I end the stream here, it should be able to go to comments. Because just the comment section is where I go to actually look through and review what the different topics that people want. Um, live chat disappears, so I won't be able to see your, your suggestion, but that is a good one. What about some videos about database optimization? Uh, anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I hope you guys did enjoy it, and I will talk to you guys 